wonderful panel to um, discuss some of the lessons learned uh, uh, from the fight against ISIS and what the future of terrorism might look like. Obviously, we had a, a, a very lethal terrorist attack in Sri Lanka from an ISIS affiliate just earlier this week. We had the, uh, so it's unfortunately a very relevant discussion. Uh, leading, the, leading this discussion will be Karen Greenberg, a long-term friend of New America, who runs the Center of Na on National Security at Fordham University. She also edits the Fordham's extremely uh, good uh, national security brief, which comes every morning, which I recommend you subscribe to. It's a little bit depressing every day, but um, it is a, probably, I think, the best roundup of national security news uh, in, in, in English. Uh, Karen is the editor or author of multiple books. She's one of the world's leading experts on Guantanamo. She's also one of the world's uh, leading experts on kind of the way the Department of Justice has approached counterterrorism. Uh, and I'll turn it over to her. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, you, we are in for a wonderfully exciting discussion here. But first, um, if you could turn your attention to the television screens on either side. You have to take a poll. Um, and so I'm going to give you the question and then tell you what to do. So the question is, in 2030, how many US troops will be operating on the ground in Syria and Iraq? Um, and uh, the, this is how to text it. You text F-U-T-S-E-C-F-O-R-U-M, FUTSEC Forum 2019, to 22333. Um, and here are the answers. A is zero, B is one to 500, C is 500 to 5,000, and D is over 5,000. Again, you text it to 22333. Your answers are anonymous. And the question, I'll repeat it one time. In 2030, how many US troops will be operating on the ground in Syria and Iraq? That's a tough question, I think. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer, and then we're going to go forward. Data is flowing in. If it were an easier question, you would have only given me two seconds. <laughs> exactly. Okay, good. We're going to move on. Um, so um, this panel is, is convened to look at what the threat of ISIS is, how to think about ISIS going forward, how to think about terrorism and counterterrorism um, in the future. And I don't think we could have a better group of uh, panelists to talk to you about this. I'm going to introduce them very briefly. But let me just start by saying, as you know from reading the press, there's been some uh, concern about whether there is a sense that ISIS is over, that somehow taking away the caliphate has meant the end of ISIS. There's been an awful lot of pushback on this from experts in government and outside of government, uh, mostly outside, I think, that, that ISIS's message is very strong, that um, it's turned into a, a messaging organization of some sophistication and of incredible breadth. Um, Peter mentioned the morning brief. There's an article in the, the brief this morning uh, from The Atlantic about this, and I, I, I recommend that all of you look to it, um, about just how ISIS um, retrenched uh, thought about or didn't think about but reacted to the um, demise of the caliphate and what this meant and for how many people this messaging is estimated to be reaching. And so we'll talk about all of that, but I just wanted to, to set it up. You have ample bios of each one of these people, but so I will, we're gonna, they're going to speak in order, um, and I'm going to begin by introducing all of them, and then Jen will begin. Jen Easterly, currently global head of Morgan Stanley Cybersecurity Fusion Center. Before that, she was special assistant to the president and former um, senior director for CT at the NSC. Um, you're going to hear that a lot director of NSC here. Josh Geltzer next to her, to her left, executive director now 
of, of the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, where he's also visiting professor at Georgetown. Formerly, he was senior director for CT at the NSC, and before that, deputy legal advisor there. To his left, Colonel Christopher Costa now has this great new job um, as head of the International Spy Museum, which I encourage you all to visit when it's, when it's re launched. Um, he was senior director for counterterrorism at the NSC at the beginning of this administration and special assistant to the president. And finally, Nick Rasmussen, now senior director of the McCain Institute's counterterrorism program at ASU here in Washington, D.C. And before that, director, as you know, of the uh, National Counterterrorism Center. And before that, many, many things, which you can read about in, in the, um, in the uh, program. So, um, you know, because we have them all here, I wanted Jen to start by talking about um, her role, but also about what the NSC is, what it does, how it functions, and the, and the way she had to think about taking what she learned from her predecessors and reformulating in a way that was focused how she thought about the criteria uh, um, for her strategy and, and just talk generally about Great. that in two minutes. Well, no, I'm just kidding. Just two minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm encouraged that uh, we put CT on the, uh, on the agenda for this future security conference because I think one of the themes you'll hear from us is CT will always be part of uh, the national security sort of considerations. Um, it's great to be here and, and I think there's a key theme here in terms of uh, the nonpartisan nature of counterterrorism. You have three senior directors for CT across three administrations, which I think shows you that this really is the purview of uh, professionals and not a political activity, which I think is good news. Um, just briefly, in terms of the job of the senior director for counterterrorism on the National Security Council uh, staff, so our job essentially is to coordinate and develop global counterterrorism policy and strategy. Uh, all of us also chaired what's called the CSG, or the Counterterrorism Security Group, which is composed of all the CT heads across the interagency. So NCTC, the heads of CT at CIA, FBI, NSA, Justice, State, Treasury, uh, Department of Homeland Security. And again, working together to build policy that gets teed up to the Deputies Committee, the Principals Committee, and to the President, ultimately, to make policy and strategy. So I think that, as a baseline, is important. I think another thing that we can sort of talk our way through here is, you know, words do matter. This panel is called Defeating ISIS, lessons we can take from that. You know, we spent a lot of time walking through what words we wanted to use, whether it was defeat or destroy or dismantle or deny or disrupt or, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of verbs that actually have significant implications from a resource perspective um, and from an expectations perspective, and I know we'll talk a little bit about that. But as I thought about what are the key lessons learned you know, some of it uh, accrues to this idea of having somebody within the White House who is actually driving counterterrorism policy and strategy and helping to set priorities. And I think that is, you know, incredibly important and needs to be extensible across any administration. And I'm sure Chris is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, when you think about the trajectory of what we did in the Obama administration in the second term, I think some starting points you need to talk your way through is what Nick produced when he was the senior director, which was the national strategy for CT uh, in 2011, right after uh, the death of Osama bin Laden, which was very, and I think rightfully so, very focused on Al Qaeda. And then all the tools that we used to be able to counter uh, the terrorist threat. And one thing that you'll see is it's not rocket science. There's sort of a set of tools that are used across all administrations, and really at the end of the day, it's calibrating to how you assess the threat and the effects that you want to have, again, going back to whatever D word uh, you want to use. And so when, we, when I came in in 2013, we had the national strategy for CT. We also had sort of a characterization that came out of a speech that President Obama gave at the National Defense University uh, that was rolling out what was the presidential policy guidance to focus on our framework for enabling lethal action. And interestingly, the threat there was described as uh, lethal but less capable Al Qaeda affiliates, uh, threats to embassies, remember this was after Benghazi, and businesses, and then 
homegrown violent extremists. And I think in retrospect, we probably didn't get that right. You know, we were very focused on, we've damaged Al-Qaeda in this way, um, but we sort of missed the growth of, of ISIS, and we can talk, talk our way through that. But when, we came, when I came in in 2013, it was very much focused on Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the, the embassy threat that had happened that summer, uh, the movement of what we called Al-Qaeda veterans, also called the Khorasan Group, from uh, AFPAC area to Syria. So we were worried about the development of what's, what was al-Nusra and really is Al-Qaeda in Syria. And certainly we're watching ISIS, you know, in January taking over Ramadi and Fallujah, but we're not seeing that necessarily as our primary focus area. So when ISIS ended up taking over Mosul in June, it was, you know, it really forced us to sort of recalibrate the threat uh, as we knew it, and then try and figure out the right strategy and policy that we needed to put in place. And I always felt a little bit that we were, in the effort to try and calibrate the right effects we wanted to have, and not to over-rotate, because of course at one point in time we had hundreds of thousands of troops in Iraq, um, but to ensure that we were, we were focused on in some cases, sort of minimum footprint, minimum force. And so the first strategy that we worked on was, of course, the strategy to counter ISIS in Iraq and Syria, very, very focused on that part of the world. And it, it was not a public strategy, but you can go ahead and look at the White House fact sheet, which walks through what we call the nine lines, which is you know, your CT toolkit, essentially, uh, effective governance, so working from a diplomatic perspective, uh, denying ISIL's territory using lethal force, capacity building, enhancing ISIS collection, disrupting their finances, disrupting their ideology, providing humanitarian support, and protecting the homeland. Again, it's all of those effects that you want to have, but calibrated to that threat. And then as we started to implement that, then we were seeing attacks around the world. So it was the development of the caliphate and all these provinces, uh, eight of them officially and, and many others unofficially. And so you know, we spent 2015 coming up with the strategy to counter ISIS's global expansion. Uh, and then towards the end of that year, you had San Bernardino and the worries around uh, inspired, and we see that today in Sri Lanka, as Peter alluded to, inspired terrorism. And so we were constantly trying to figure out how to get the strategy right and calibrate it uh, so that we weren't over-rotating from a resource and expectations perspective, but that we you know, were actually trying to have an effect on the, on the threat environment. I think we ended up getting that right, but it was a bit of, of push and pull um, with, the, with the entire policy community. Um, in terms of the lessons learned just broadly, again, I think leadership, uh, having a disciplined policy process absolutely matters. I think making sure that you're calibrating the capabilities and the partnerships, we had a lot of focus on that in the Obama administration, and we can talk through that now. And then this thread, frankly, that's pulled from the early days when Nick was a director for counterterrorism and I was working as the executive assistant to Condoleezza Rice in the Bush administration, this idea that Tom Kane talked about in the 9-11 Commission of the failure of imagination. And I think that is something that we all need to continue to take away because uh, ISIS is not defeated. The idea of ISIS is not defeated. Their physical caliphate may in fact be defeated and we should applaud that. Um, but the idea continues, and we see it again in Sri Lanka and, and attacks around the world. And so we need to continue to make that a priority, but obviously calibrate the resources and the expectations against how we assess the threat to be. Josh, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, this failure of imagination, which is another way of saying, um, how much do we know, how much do we not know? And the balance between being preventive and being reactive, and how it's all kind of falls into the same, your guys' jobs. You know, basically you're responsible for all of that. And so take us forward a little bit to the cyber, to the cyber realm and the cyber threat, <coughs> but if you could just sort of talk about that a little bit, it would be good. Uh, that sounds great, Karen, and, and it is really a treat to get to be up here with, with you. Karen is a great uh, thought leader in the field and, and with three people who have been just incredibly kind uh, mentors to me in government and, and friends uh, ever since. So it's really nice to get to be here and have this conversation, especially with this great group. And I will pick up uh, in some ways where, where Jen uh, brought the story. And to go to Karen's point, one thing that I think we did try to 
use some imagination and, and, and get ahead of the curve on was among the more notable distinctive characteristics of ISIS. There, there were multiple, the physical territory being obviously one of them, but the group's ability to use the internet, to use uh, social media, file upload sites, and reach out in various ways globally through the internet, through apps on folks' phones, uh, was clearly um, not only driving what they were already doing, because it, it was part of their um, battlefield tactics, it helped scare away what, what might otherwise have been Iraqi army and, and even civilian resistance to them as they rolled into places like Mosul. But it, it played an even broader role, broader in the sense of at the level of strategy, broader in a geographic sense as well. So this was clearly something happening, not just on battlefields where the government might try through partnerships or directly to push back, but it was happening on the private sector and its platforms. It was happening on YouTube and Twitter and on Facebook. And that meant we had to think about it differently because those folks were not in the meetings that Jen was talking about before. And it was clear that we needed to get out of our comfort zone and away from only the tools represented by the bodies that show up at those meetings, diplomatic authorities, law enforcement authorities, intelligence community authorities, and try to get help uh, and, and empower, but also get help from those outside government. So real quickly, three ways in which I think we tried to build structural devices to get ahead of it, and then a word on where it's gone since. But uh, on January 8, 2016, the White House announced three things all the same day, all designed to be different manifestations of creativity uh, thrown at this problem set. One was that uh, Dennis McDonough, the, the chief of staff, uh, to President Obama and Lisa Monaco, the president's top counterterrorism advisor, had jointly hosted a meeting. And they'd taken most of the National Security Cabinet with them and gone to wa uh, from Washington out to California and met with the leaders of tech companies and said, so we don't agree on some things right now. And encryption was one of those things they didn't agree on. But we can find some other things that we do agree on. And this was especially in the wake of San Bernardino which really had been uh, a bit of a jolt to the national consciousness on this issue, and had a productive beginning to a conversation about ways in which the government and the tech sector could do more and perhaps learn from each other on these issues. We can come back to some of what has flow flowed from that really important moment in the conversation. But the same day, the, the government also announced that they were going to look at domestically how to empower actors better to push back on ISIS's messaging and abroad. The domestic manifestation was something called the Countering Violent Extremism Task Force. It was housed at the Department of Homeland Security. It had interagency representation from across the government. And the theory of the case was the government isn't going to be the best actor at knowing who in the community is going down a path of radicalization or how to turn that person away from it. But the government can provide resources, research, empower those in the community who can. Similar theory of the case was behind the Global Engagement Center, which was at the State Department. And you're, you're in State Department authorities here, so you're focused on audiences abroad. But at this point, we could see that audiences abroad and audiences at home were, at least in some tiny proportion of all those whom ISIS is trying to reach, some of them were going to respond to that call, that call to violence. And this was a way to try to, in a sense, inoculate audiences from responding, from letting vulnerable individuals be dragged down a path of, of radicalization. Now, we can talk about where those structures have, have gone. I think they've had their ups and their downs bureaucratically, resource-wise, since then. But my point is really that that was an attempt to, to, to have that imagination and to say, if this is where ISIS is going, if this is where terrorism is going, because these are actors that learn from each other. Once, once ISIS puts out slicker online magazines and videos that look more like teasers for Hollywood movies, Al-Qaeda will do the same. Other groups will do the same, and they did. Um, this was a way to be creative and try to empower actors outside the government to help in the fight. Now, in terms of where the threat is now, real, real quickly, I think we've seen a, ISIS in particular complicate how it uses the online space. So then we had a couple of paradigms in mind. We had the idea of end-to-end -end encryption facilitating attacks among operatives, right? Folks who already were very much ISIS, but who wanted to coordinate an attack without intelligence community or law enforcement detection. Then we had the idea of reaching a mass audience, Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, trying to, to share their message globally uh, very cheaply. Uh, and then we had the idea of taking individuals who responded to that call and leading them 
maybe in smaller settings, encrypted conversations, down a path of individual radicalization and violence. I think ISIS has taken those paradigms and complicated that whole spectrum. They do more with the internet now than they did then. They receive things. They receive pledges of loyalty. They inspire individuals who then can find materials at the tactical level and figure out what they themselves want to do with that inspiration, where, when, what sort of attacks they want to launch. And as we try to figure out what happened in Sri Lanka, they even seem to be able to link up with what are at one point locally oriented terrorist groups and bring them into the ISIS fold, which can be done in a whole host of ways, formal and informal. So in the years since, I think we've seen ISIS complicate and add to what it can do to weaponize the internet. And I think we need to continue to have that imagination to keep up with it or better yet, get ahead of it. Thank you. So Chris, let's talk a little bit about what Jen and Josh handed over for you to take over. And, um, and we'd love to get your take on um, just how counterterrorism played in the early days. I know you've written some about this. Um, in terms of the other national security equities that were right. fighting for attention. Um, how you see that conversation at the beginning of this administration and where you think it is um, now in terms of, and I'm going to come back to this for all of you afterwards, but in terms of how to assess the ISIS threat now, where do you place it in the national security framework? Thanks for the question, Karen, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak on this panel with colleagues and friends. And that's the, the first point I want to make. The fact that we are colleagues and friends sends a little bit about our, our community. So first, right up front, I came in on Inauguration Day. And I like to articulate on day one, we had some day one problems. And those problems were in four bins, if you will. First, we had a significant threat to commercial aviation. Secondly, we had to make a decision on a raid or not to conduct a raid against Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And third, we recognized there had been some great work done on ISIS, but we were going to accelerate the campaign. We were going to ramp it up as quickly as practicable. And the last point I want to make is all of us work, worked on hostage issues. We don't talk a lot about that, but we had American hostages being held in Africa, we had hostages in the Middle East, and we had hostages in South Asia. So those were day one problems. But let me dial back a little bit from my predecessors, from Jen and Josh, and Nick was already in place at the NCTC. But what I inherited was an excellent process. They had an excellent reputation. They left me thick binders filled with information, but I only had four hours with Jen. <laughs> and uh, I listened for four hours, and as we've said in different forums, uh, I don't think we took a break, and that was problematic for me, but that's another discussion. Um, there was a staying arc of continuity on counterterrorism issues between administrations, and that's a key point. Some people don't like to hear that, but that's a fact. There was a continuity, counterterrorism professionals working on counterterrorism problems. We didn't have an updated counterterrorism strategy, and we began working on that. Along with those day one problems, we started working the day two problems, which meant we needed a new strategic framework for counterterrorism, built cumulatively from our predecessors. And it had to be, it had to be supported by the intelligence that we were seeing. So that's what the team went to work on, and that happened really weeks into the new administration, and it lasted long after I had left, nine months, I think, after I had left, before the counterterrorism policy was published. The national counterterrorism strategy, I should say, better put, was published. And I think it's an excellent document. It, it does a very good job, I think, attacking a new threat picture. In other words, looking at ISIS, Al-Qaeda was no longer the threat. We had new technologies that we hadn't necessarily addressed in some of our public documents. And we attacked those vectors, and we made it very public, again, after I'd left the administration. But I think implicit in that document is this very idea that we're also dealing with gray zone dynamics. And we're trying to get our arms around what that means. And I think it is a lucid document, but it's Although it's the Trump counterterrorism strategy, I think what's important to note, 
again, I'll use the word cumulative. It's built on past strategies. And I, I should also emphasize another point I want to make. I think we all recognize that we have to continue the counterterrorism pressure. Not to put Nick you know, on the spot here, I've heard him utter those words over and over again in interagency meetings. All of us echoed that, which is a euphemism for militarized approaches to direct action. That has to be coupled with the things that you just heard from jo Josh and Jen. We recognize that. I think it's a good balanced strategy. So that's how the beginning of the administration shaped. And then the other part of your question, Karen, take a little water, goes back to another thesis that I have, that the counterterrorism enterprise is in a very good place. What I worry about is an overcorrection, that other policy considerations eventually will make CT less important. Because particularly the further we get away from 9-11. And that's what I worry about. So at every chance I have to articulate my concerns, my biggest concern is what I call an overcorrection. And I didn't see it while I was certainly at the NSC, but I worry, again, as we get further and further away from 9-11, and we don't have, knock on wood, a catastrophic attack, then we can focus on other other more important uh, policy initiatives. And that is a s central concern I have. So my last point is the CT enterprise is solid. It's on good footing. Don't mess with it. You can streamline it, but allow it to exist because we were part of that enterprise and uh, we're, just, we're just the tip of the iceberg. The whole interagency is behind this, and I think it's in a very good place. And it's a model of how the government should operate in other spheres. But I'll just stop there. Thank you. So, Nick, you're going to, you have the wise man view of, of years and years of, I'm I don't sorry, know why that's... <laughs> thinking about um, this problem um, being you know, in the right place at the right time when so many of the wrong things happened. Um, and I, I, um, I'd like you to give us our thoughts a little bit on, on um, in terms of a failure of imagination, do you worry about future failures of imagination? In terms of our CT strategy being in the right place, um, are we in the right place? Are there things that should have been attended to in the past that weren't appended to that, that keep you up at night? Um, Sure, and again, batting cleanup in this lineup, um, there's a lot to draw on uh, Karen's questions and of course the comments of my friends and colleagues here. If I'm thinking of though a, a kind of a theme that, or a takeaway that, I, that I've developed over my period of time working in and around counterterrorism strategy, it's, it's a theme that centers around humility. Um, the words that Jen threw around a, f a few minutes ago, defeat, destroy, deny, the D words that we tended to populate our strategies with, whether they were in the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and now in the Trump administration. The words matter, as Jen said, and we often set for ourselves very ambitious ob objectives, which even if we were maximally resourced, even if everything broke our way in the international environment, even if every positive um, projection of the international environment that you could develop um, came true, we still would have struggled to meet those objectives on the kind of timeline that we were setting for ourselves. So what's the, the antidote to that is not to tr you know, stop trying. You don't stop trying. But I guess my takeaway from that is that when we set objectives, when we set strategy, we ought to be more realistic, we ought to be more candid, we ought to be more bounded in our setting of expectations. Because to Chris's point, I think if any one of us were sitting here and briefing a new president in two years, four years, eight years, whenever that may be, we, that, that man or woman will be sitting down and, and being given a serious introduction into whatever the threat environment is that we face at that moment. And that counterterrorism enterprise, that apparatus that, that that, that Chris described, will be at the disposal of that president. And that threat may have shifted up or down by some degree of you know, 10, 15% one way or the other. But my guess is it will look largely like the threat environment we face today, plus or minus. And so um, 
as a strategy, as a matter of strategy, that argues more for words like manage, contain, suppress, control, cope. Resilience is obviously an end state objective in that environment. Now, of course, pol strategies are both policy documents, they're also political documents. And the words I just used do not soar rhetorically. Um, they sound like you are you know, going to the doctor, in a sense. Um, <laughs> But I would argue, you know, unless you can, unless someone, someone smarter than I can paint a picture where the, some of what Josh described in terms of the, the ISIS narrative um, is defeated somehow, then I don't see how we are out of this business, as, as it were, in the near term. And so what, at the same time, though, um, to Chris's point, we are in an environment where a whole set of other national security challenges have raced their way up the ladder and demanded attention. And, and anybody who is a counterterrorism person or expert would not sit here and tell you that any of those are any less deserving of the policy, resource, um, intelligence, military, all of our toolkit attention needs to be devoted at those issues too. But we will be, as I said, playing in this environment, this counterterrorism environment, from now through this presidency, the next presidency, and I would argue the presidency beyond that. So the, the challenge in my mind is how do you sustain the investment we've made, not dismantle the capability that we've acquired, do so, try to do that while creating some efficiencies, um, and that puts a great, great deal of challenge upon all of the individuals who are, are, who are our successors. I told Joe McGuire, uh, who took over my position as the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, that he had a much tougher job than I, because he was going to have to do everything that I did, probably some additional things beyond what I did, but in a, in a resource-constrained environment. And for much of the post-9-11 uh, period, those of us in the counterterrorism world were not resource-constrained. I think that's the, the gentle way to put it. And now trade-offs will have to be made. Trade-offs in the intelligence community, trade-off in our deployed force around the world, trade-offs across literally every one of our um, um, elements of our toolkit. And that's, that's going to be the art and the science for our, for our successors at the White House and the National Security Council staff is making intelligent trade-offs and not leaving ourselves vulnerable to surprise due to failure of imagination. And I'll stop there, Karen. So I'm going to ask each, each one of you to just answer briefly one more question, and then we'll turn it over to your questions. And that is, if you, if you were called in and they said to you, um, look, we just want one tool that you think we should really focus on? Would it be, and I don't know if it would be your unplugged, um, but w is there a, is there a, um, is there one thing that you would say, look, whatever else you do, here's something that might not be on your list that I, I think you should pay attention to. It's n it, it may be a little out of the ordinary, but what is it? So. Well, since you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> so. Cause I, what you're, you know, what you're referring to, not really a tool, because I think, yeah, you know, I suspect that we would all be hard pressed to give you one tool. It can't just be lethal action. No. You know, I think partnerships. There's all kinds of things. What Karen was referring to is, you know, try and deal with this whole idea about trying to think out of the box, if you will, about threats and tools that we could use that might not be traditional. Uh, we, you know, I mentioned we chaired this group called the Counterterrorism Security Group, and we had a lot of meetings, uh, sometimes four or five a week. But once a month or so, we would do something called CSG, which came to be known as CSG Unplugged from the MTV Unplugged. Uh, but it was just getting together the really smart CT professionals across the interagency and thinking in an unconstrained way about things that we could do to deal with. Uh, the threat environment, and I found that to be actually, you know, a really useful exercise, um, a lot of fun as well, but it was, again, trying to force yourself to think in new ways about that threat to deal with this whole idea of the power uh, of imagination, and we had some good ideas that came out of that, actually, that we ended up uh, implementing, and so, again, just goes back to the theme of you have to be able to sort of think expansively of, of the threat. Um, to get ahead of it, and then then acknowledging the resource world that you live in to be able to calibrate the tools that you have against uh, the threat that you assess. So I'll, I'll, I'll take this in a somewhat different direction, and it's a tool that, it, it's not gonna solve the problem, but it can make the problem a lot worse if it's misused, and that's the bully pulpit. And frankly, you had from the Bush administration into the Obama administration, a lot of care in how the president talked about 
terrorism. And whether that terrorism was Al Qaeda, ISIS, or at times things happening on US soil that we call domestic terrorism, even though that label has its, 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 its problems. Uh, I think you actually saw, to Chris's point earlier, a lot of continuity in presidents who tried to distinguish bad acts and bad actors from whole groups of people. And um, again, the, using that pulpit correctly, it can build resilience. It can help um, explain to the public what they should and shouldn't fear. It's not going to solve the problem, but if you don't handle the bully pulpit correctly, it can make it a lot worse. And to my mind, you see some of that making it worse right now. And you see, after something like a Christchurch attack for the President of the United States to indicate that one brand of violent extremism is just a few folks and, and not a real problem, it, it, it to me feeds into a narrative that is growing. And it is, goes back to my point earlier about how the, the internet connects people, good but also sometimes bad. You have ISIS's spokesperson come out after Christchurch and say, look, Muslims of the world, if Western governments can't protect you, can't even acknowledge that you are the victims of a, of a terrorist act like this, you need to understand that's why we're here. We can protect you. And so the bully pulpit um, is a tool that I, I would like to see us return to using a lot, a lot more wisely. Interesting. Chris. So I told you what my day one problems were, but I came in to the White House intending to work on counter ideology, counter radicalization. I just did not have the luxury to work on those efforts as much as I would have liked to. So now I can do that a little bit at the Spy Museum. And what I've done is reached out to former terrorists and have them speak credible voices, telling their story, the, the evil of their ways, if you will, in their words. And I think that's very important to do those kinds of things. And we have a lot of former terrorists that are going to be released in the United States. We talked about that number. I don't know what it is, maybe under 30 or so. But they're going to be released from prison. What they do with their time after that is very important to the nation. And hopefully what they do is use credible voices and go out and speak against the kind of radicalization that we see. So I think those are some important efforts. I wished I had focused more on counter-radicalization, uh, quite candidly. So credible voices is an important program and should be adopted. If not by the government, by nonprofits should take that on. So you've, you've probably picked up on the fact that because we span you know, a whole number of years um, of working across the counterterrorism enterprise, there is some pride that we each feel for kind of what has been built over time. And Chris, Chris articulated it most clearly. But if I had to come in and, and brief somebody new and say, where do things need to be re-architected? Where do things really need to be looked at with a fresh eye? I would, I would go to this, this area that Josh just alluded to, what we are, I would call, just for ease of conversation, domestic terrorism. Because the enterprise that we described and having so much pride in is geared towards an international terrorism threat. And I was just thinking to myself, and I've articulated this in some other settings with Josh in recent months, when if, if a, an event like the Tree of Life Synagogue uh, massacre or something like that happens in the United States, um, we largely look to the FBI to, to fix the problem in the aftermath using their law enforcement tools. We don't necessarily think about bringing our entire counterterrorism apparatus together to figure out, okay, what is, what is the next step about getting ahead of this threat? And that's by no means, in fact, it's the exact opposite of a criticism of the FBI. I'm, the FBI is the preeminent law enforcement organization in the world, in my mind, but they should not be left on their own to deal with domestic terror as simply a matter of law enforcement. And, and I, I give great credit to, to Chris and the team at the uh, White House that put together the, the, the emergent document, the CT strategy from the Trump administration. It did include language about addressing domestic terrorism threats. But now, of course, we need to see, will that actually be executed and implemented? Will that actually be resourced? Will structures that we inherited and, and that we refined actually be turned in the direction of dealing with this problem as well as the problems of ISIS and Al Qaeda and groups like that operating overseas? It's a huge challenge for the counterterrorism community that we've now stepped away from, but it's one that I, I, I hope they embrace. Because if you're not dealing with that problem here at home, um, we're not living up to our obligation to the American people to keep them safe. Time for your questions. There'll be a roving mic. Um, I, and um, we're, we, we're going to go over a little because we started 10 minutes late. So um, over here. <laughs>
and Mart Hibbison with ZDF German TV. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Given the fact that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi just appeared in a new video, which was released today, um, in coincidence, or not coincidence, with what happened in Sri Lanka a couple of days ago, what should be the most urgent response from the US? And that would be a question to all of you, to what looks like kind of a revitalization of ISIS, given the fact that the leader is now for the first time after five years, I think, appearing in the video. Thank you. Nick, you want to take that? It's interesting that this issue came up because we actually had a conversation in the green room before this about, okay, pause it for a moment that we were to find out that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi had been killed in a kinetic strike um, in Iraq in the last 24 hours. Would that change the way we, we collectively look at the threat picture? And our answer, in a nutshell, was not really, certainly not in the near term, because all of that which we described over the last 35, 40 minutes, I think would still pertain. We still would very much be confronting an ideological narrative that still finds resonance across conflict zones all across the world. Um, does that mean we should place any less of a priority on going after the leadership hierarchy of ISIS, whether that's on the ground in Iraq and Syria or in other conflict zones? Of course not, because that's a key piece of dismantling or, de or degrading an organization. Um, but it is not a cure-all, and it still leaves us very much in the business of having to confront the ideological challenge around the world. The only thing I'd add to that was sort of off the back of what Josh described in terms of the relationships we tried to forge with the tech community to prevent ISIS from having a platform for recruitment and radicalization. I do think we made some strides. Uh, I don't think it's enough uh, when uh, we can still have these videos proliferate across the internet, when they can still be used to inspire and keep alive the idea of ISIS and the caliphate. Um, I think we have a lot more work to do, and I realize it's a difficult thing now being uh, back in cyber, um, but I think that is, uh, it's an effort that we need to continue to work with the, the tech community on. Peter. Picking up, picking up on what Nick said about uh, domestic terrorism, you know, uh, is there a need for a domestic terrorism statute? Of course, there are all the sort of First Amendment problems, but the release of this Coast Guard child of Hassan, you know, who had accumulated this huge arsenal of weapons and was planning to, seems like, kill CNN and M MSNBC anchors and Democratic politicians, he was let out of uh, jail on, on Thursday. Now, if, he, if he'd been in any way affiliated with ISIS, presumably he'd still be in, in, in detention. So is there a need for a domestic terrorism statute, notwithstanding that there are some First Amendment issues uh, in, in, in that question? Gee, one lawyer on the panel. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Who would that be? <laughs> well, the, the, yeah, Peter asked a question that Karen and I were having a lively discussion about Actually, before, and that, that um, uh, Nick and I have, have written about as with, with another former colleague of ours, Mary, Mary McCord. And uh, my short answer is I do think there's value in that. I do think there's value in a statute that would make terrorism itself a federal crime. It's funny, we call it a domestic terrorism statute. It would actually apply to any terror. You could use it against jihadists, too, but it would take the definition that's currently in the US code uh, and, and make a crime of it. Now, right now, um, of course, those who commit acts that we all recognize as being domestic terrorism, um, they generally get prosecuted either for other federal charges, like using a weapon of mass destruction, something like that, or they get prosecuted under, under state charges. Um, so some people say, what's the gap? It seems to me that there are practical gaps, and this issue of, of, of pre-trial pre release has at least pointed at one. But there's just a moral gap there, too. These acts are politically mo motivated violence. And it seems to me civilized society has, at home and ideally abroad, taken that and said that's unacceptable. You don't use violence to pursue political aims. You can use all sorts of other tactics, but not violence. And to make that clear that that's true, whether you're inspired by ISIS or whether you're inspired by white supremacist rhetoric and messaging, that seems to me of some moral value. That doesn't mean we replicate exactly the legislation we have for, for foreign terrorist organizations at the domestic level, which would have all sorts of legal complications associated with it. It does mean you build in all sorts of oversight to ensure that this sort of statute wouldn't be used actually for a government that wanted to crack down on groups that they just dislike. There are ways to build it, I think, that would be sensitive to the distinctive nature of what happens here at home and the way in which politics and what we call terrorism can at least be abused by those who'd want to exploit that. 
But the short answer to my mind, Peter, is there's room for something to be done there. One more question over here. Thank you very much, amazing panel. I would like to focus my question on the United States. So in the United States, upholding radical views falls under the First Amendment. So what mechanisms and processes can you put in place to avoid, well, to let the individual uphold his radical views, but without never reaching that tipping point that would make him fall from radicalization into mobilization? That's a hard one. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'll start with just sort of one, one thing that, that I remember hearing about with, with Jen and in the early days of, of some of those from America being drawn towards joining ISIS as foreign fighters, which is you had FBI truly going to families, to parents, and saying, look, we see your child from what they're doing online, from what our other sources are telling us, going down this road of radicalization. And at some point, they're going to cross the, the threshold into committing a federal crime. They're going to conspire or attempt to provide themselves as material support to a foreign terrorist organization. And we're going to do what we, we're supposed to do, what we as FBI are charged to do, which is work with the prosecutors of the Justice Department and stop them, ideally, from getting on that plane or pick them up right as they've committed that crime. We may save their life in doing it, but they're going to serve a long time in prison. We'd really rather you talk them out of it now. And um, too often, I think, that attempt at an intervention didn't succeed, and FBI then did what it is its job to do, which is stop people from committing federal crimes, including that provision of oneself to a terrorist group. But I think an ideal world, and this is part of what we tried to build with some of the structures I talked about before, before the person crosses that threshold into criminal activity, you empower communities to turn them away, to intervene. And that's not what uh, folks at FBI signed up to do, to put 16 and 17 year olds who've been seduced by the, 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 the terrorist messaging of a group halfway around the world. That's not really what they wanted to get at. But ultimately, when that threshold is crossed, that is their job. And that was sort of one of the things we tried to build with the CVE task force that, that Josh talked about that was set up in January 8th, 2016, and I think that effort has now fallen apart. Um, so that's a place where I think deserves greater focus. I mean, there's a sweet spot here. There is not going to be a federalized response that is going to create the kind of community intervention model that's going to do exactly what Josh described. On the other hand, the federal government can and should be a catalyst a provider of resources, a curator of best practices, and do that in a way that doesn't suggest that they're only there to collect intelligence and, and look for the next arrest that they can make. Um, I would argue that we still haven't found that sweet spot. We were trying very hard at the tail end of the Obama administration, but even then, our best efforts were sometimes met with suspicion and um, um, outright hostility by some of the communities that we wanted to work more closely with. I would say on the, on the, on the, con on the congressional side, be a little tolerant of failure in this regard. You know, give, the, give the executive branch credit for trying and, and maybe perhaps live with a little bit less than perfect return on investment because this is hard stuff. But in my mind, if you succeed one out of three or one out of four times at, at, at that kind of conversation that Josh just, just described, that's one person you don't have to put away for 50 or 60 years or ruin their life by, uh, by putting them into the judicial system. And, and I wouldn't underestimate uh, some of the progress that has been made, although it might not look like that. Um, in 2018, there were 15 cross, you know, indictments of ISIS-related terrorism crimes. I mean, that's so much lower than we've seen for such a long time. So who knows? You know, just um, we are out of time. We're more than out of time. Um, but let me just add my answer to the tools of the tools that have that we should be relying on. This. One of the things is people who understand this deeply, who have thought about it, who are colleagues. This is an incredible resource for the country to have. And so I just want to add it into the mix. And thank you. And join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>